This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. This is a podcast from the archives of the BBC Wreath Lectures. This lecture in the series The Englishness of English Art, given by Nicholas Pevsner, was originally broadcast in 1955. We present the sixth in the series of BBC Wreath Lectures on the Englishness of English Art, given by Dr Nicholas Pevsner. In this lecture, Dr Pevsner deals with Constable and the Pursuit of Nature. Constable never visited Italy, nor did he visit Paris. Neither did Blake, neither did Gainsborough, neither did Hogarth. I don't think Constable seriously wanted to know Italy. There is a letter of his about someone's mind and talent mouldering away at Rome. And in an address to students of the Royal Academy, he warned them not to be in too great haste to seek instruction in the schools of France, Germany or Italy. Yet he was an ardent worshipper of Claude Lorraine's Italian landscapes. And he once wrote to his friend, Archdeacon Fisher, that he feared he might be doomed, these are his words, doomed never to see the living scenes that inspired the landscapes of Claude. That seems to contradict what I said just now. However, the passage immediately goes on like this. But I was born to paint a happier land, my own dear old England, and when I cease to love her, May I, as Wordsworth says, never more hear her green leaves rustle and her torrents roar. Constable loved his country, and if such love can be taken as an indication of frank, uh, of naive Englishness, then Constable ought to be as promising a case for my purpose in these lectures as Hogarth, who signed himself Britophile, and as Blake, who called himself English Blake. Blake and Constable are contemporaries, and they are what Blake called contraries. They have indeed hardly anything in common. Constable and Hogarth can more easily be compared. Nature is simple, plain and true in all her works. Constable could have said that, but in fact Hogarth did. By a close observation of nature, the artist discovers qualities which have never been portrayed before. Now, Hogarth could have said that, but Constable did. And who would you guess said at the beginning of his career, there is room enough for a natural perture? Actually, it was Constable. Now, Blake, on the other hand, said natural objects always do weaken, deaden, and obliterate imagination in me. But now, to return to their Englishness as it appears in their art, Blake's Britain is a dim, druidical Albion. Hogarth Britain is the noise and bustle of London. Constable is the English countryside, and more specifically the Suffolk countryside, where he grew up, the son of a miller. There his art, as he said so truly, his art is to be found under every hedge and in every lane. So is, of course, Hogarth, under every pub sign and in every alleyway of London. But there the comparison ends. For Hogarth is a storyteller, and Constable is emphatically not. And Hogarth wants, as Garrick once put it, to charm the mind and through the eye correct the heart, whereas Constable had no such extraneous programme. He contradicts thereby what I put before you when I talked about Hogarth's reporting, namely the English artist's literary leaning. But the contradiction is only on the surface, and it can largely be solved by a look at the change in the whole of Europe between the age of reason and the age of romanticism. Observation remained, but it was no longer the observation of man in his actions, but the observation of nature nor was it any longer so much the observation of man simply in his likeness. Uh, That is to say, portrait went on, of course, but painters of the highest talent, 
who in the 18th century had concentrated on portrait, now went into landscape. The years between uh, just before 1800 and about 1840 saw a prodigious flowering of landscape painting in England, unparalleled in any one country on the continent. The development starts, of course, in the mid-18th century, when Richard Wilson came back from Italy and turned from the idyllic landscapes of the South to English and Welsh landscape. Gainsborough, I told you, preferred painting landscape to painting portraits, and his landscapes have indeed the happiest insouciance of handling and the most enchanting tenderness of sentiment. Even bolder is the handling of Alexander Cousins's landscapes. For their groundwork, they have ink blots. Ink blots crossed by an accidental network of lines, which he created by crumpling the paper and smoothing it out again before the blots were made. The result has a breadth of vision and a sense of atmosphere prophetic of the 19th century. Alexander Cousins even made special cloud studies, just as Constable was going to do later. But there is yet a fundamental difference between Constable on the one hand and Wilson, Gainsborough, Cousins on the other, even Alexander Cousins' son, John Robert Cousins, whom Constable once called the greatest genius that ever touched landscape. The, these masters of the 18th century have in their compositions and their stylish handling of the brush still a self-consciousness which reflects the century's sense of superiority over nature. Nature must be composed. Nature must be improved. In this, the landscape painters actually agreed with Reynolds. And incidentally, they agreed with the improvers par excellence, that is, the 18th century landscapers, to whom I shall come later. Now all that changed with Thomas Girton, who died young in 1802, and then with Crome and Constable. Their world is the English everyday world. Their theme is atmosphere. The technique they use to interpret an ever-changing nature is open and sketchy. Now this preeminently painterly technique was not created at that time, nor was it created in England. It's the direct descendant of Venetian 16th century painting and then of Baroque painting, especially in Holland. But in England it appeared out of the blue with Hogarth. But he, as you know, didn't want to be a painter primarily. He wanted to be a teacher of morality, just as Reynolds wanted to be a teacher of classical culture. Hence, both wrote on the theory of art as well. Gainsborough was not interested in theory, interested in, in general ideas, and that is why Reynolds blamed him, in spite of his respect and a sensitive appreciation of his technique. The wording of Reynolds's reproof is that Gainsborough saw nature with the eye of a painter and not a poet. It seems absurd to us to blame a painter for seeing with the eye of a painter. But we have been, through the experience of Constable and the 19th century, with its climax in the French Impressionists. That has changed our views. It's time now to say something of the character of Constable's landscape. His motives are humble. Dedham Vale, Hampstead Heath, Willie Lott's Cottage, boat building near Flatford Mill. As C. R. Leslie, his early biographer, writes, he worked within the narrowest limit in which perhaps the studies of an artist ever were confined. But his aim could be best attained by a constant study of the same objects under every change of the seasons and of the times of day. The sky, Constable called indeed the keynote of all classes of landscape. Fancy Poussin saying something like that, or Courbet, or Cézanne. And clouds were Constable's delight and obsession. In one of his letters to Leslie, he suddenly breaks off and puts in the exclamation, I can hardly write for looking at the silvery clouds. 
On his cloud studies, you find entries such as this. September 5, 1822, 10 o'clock morning, looking southeast, brisk wind at west, very bright and fresh, grey clouds running far over a yellow bed about halfway in the sky. And we have an analysis of a painting by Reustahl from him, which is a masterpiece of analysis, not of composition, but of the weather conditions prevailing at the moment when Reustahl painted. The adjectives with which Constable describes his own pictures are very telling, too. Silvery, windy and delicious. All health, nothing stagnant. That, he said, of his painting a lock. He knew no false modesty about his achievement. He knew that his peculiar, dewy, breezy bloom had never before him been perfected on the canvas of any painter in the world. Fusely, Fusely, who belonged to the 18th century and the world of Blake, said of Constable, he makes me call for my great coat and umbrella. But Blake himself, when he saw Constable drawings, said, why, this is not drawing, but inspiration. Constable, incidentally, answered, I meant it for drawing. Even so, however, he did call himself a visionary, in order, actually, to excuse being irritable with clients and dealers. A visionary, the very word Blake used with so much more justification. I suppose, to Constable, the word must have had an undertone of vision in the optical sense. It is in any case very remarkable, I think, that the last sentences of the last of a course of lectures he gave at the Royal Institution, nine months before he died, the last sentences are like this. Painting is a science and should be pursued as an inquiry into the laws of nature. Why, then, may not landscape painting be considered as a branch of natural philosophy, of which pictures are but the experiments? Well, surely, there we are back with a bang in our subject of Englishness, the rational approach, even in Constable, where one would least expect it. And the atmospheric approach is just as English. And so is, of course, Constable's primary choice of landscape as his exclusive subject. Just as Hogarth spoke, you remember, of what the puffers in books call the great style of history painting, so Constable, in a letter in 1828, wrote, I have heard so much of the higher walks of art that I am quite sick. Hogarth's art, Constable's art, and please note also Reynolds's art. They have indeed this in common, that they are all based on close observation of what is around us, whether the behaviour of people or the features of a man or of a sky and trees. That, we have seen, is England's eternal contribution. But we have also seen, apropos Blake, and equally apropos medieval architecture, that England is ill at ease in the world of bodies, self-consciously displaying their fleshly presence. And so, when it came to landscape, in the Romantic Age, it was England that led Europe away from the landscape arranged with carefully disposed masses and towards the atmospheric landscape. That Claude Lorraine in Rome and such Dutchmen as Kuyp had done much the same in the 17th century, need not detain us here. The fact remains that Constable's searching naturalism is devoted to air, and that Turner's anti-naturalism carried him away into phantasmagorias of nothing but air. Golden visions, wrote Constable of Turner, but only visions. English landscape painting of between 1800 and 1840 is immensely varied in character and personalities. Blake's few landscapes range from the completely disembodied God moving on the face of the waters to the small, wonderfully compact woodcuts which he did for Thornton's Virgil and which almost at once released Samuel Palmer's youthful genius and gave us the landscapes of his visionary years, as Geoffrey Grigson has called them. 
Many years later, Palmer spoke of the raving mad splendor of orange twilight glow in these landscapes of his. And while he painted them, he wrote, I will, God help me, never be a naturalist by profession. The surface of a Palmer landscape is, to quote him again, all sprinkled and showered with a thousand pretty eyes and buds and blossoms gemmed with dew. Both Henry Moore and John Piper owe much to this exciting dapple. Cotman, with the heavenly peace of his smooth, flatly and coolly coloured landscapes, is the very reverse of Palmer. Yet what they have in common is the intensity of feeling for nature combined with an unreal coherence of the surface independent of the corporeal shapes which lies it where behind. A look at any Bonington landscape will show you what draws Cotman and Palmer together. Bonington, on the other hand, belongs to Constable. He has the same bold open brush strokes as Constable, that sense of breeze and never once arrested change. To explain what distinguishes the two would need more time than I could give to it here. Bonington died as early as 1828. Constable died in 37. With David Cox and with plenty of good minor painters in watercolour, this broad English achievement carried on beyond the middle of the century. Uh, I said in watercolour. Incidentally, the watercolour as such is, of course, also an English phenomenon. For one thing, it is small in scale, as are, for instance, the bosses and the capitals and the marginal little people in the Middle Ages, and as are also the wonderful 16th century miniature portraits by Hilliard and Isaac Oliver. But the watercolour as such, as a technical medium, so much thinner and, uh, and so much less full-bodied than oil, that is English too. Side by side with the pure landscapes, there are such English specialities as the sporting picture. It is characteristic enough that it is a speciality, but how it is handled is equally characteristic. Mr. Basil Taylor has recently written a pelican book on animal painting in England. The title of the book is significant, for it deals little with the popular sporting picture of the alcan and leech kind, which may be skillful reporting or boisterous cartooning, but doesn't reach higher. Where animal painting is at its best, where even the racing picture is at its best, there is no exciting action. Uh, but there is a, a curious stillness. There is no one in England to compare with Rubens in the Netherlands or Delacroix in France, uh, except perhaps James Ward. Stubbs, the greatest animal painter in England, was a scholarly student of anatomy. His compositions are, as Mr. Taylor says, very still, very fastidious. And he went to Italy in 1754 to convince himself, as he says, to convince himself that nature is always superior to art, whether Greek or Roman. Another English speciality is the open-air portrait. Other countries, at least before the Impressionists of the 1860s and 1870s, have nothing like it. I am thinking of such delightful pieces as Gainsborough's Morning Walk, or Zophany's the Garricks taking tea on the lawn by the River Thames at Hampton. Or, in a more romantic mood, of Joseph Wright of Derby's portrait of Brooke Boothby lying somewhere in his grounds and dreaming over a book he has been reading. For that is really the setting in which the open-air portrait and the sporting picture must be seen. The passion of the 18th century English for garden and park and the passion of the present-day English for gardening, which is the latter-day poor relation of landscaping. The landscape garden is the most influential of all English innovations in art. Its effects can be studied everywhere, from the United States to Russia. Now, 
the master key, I suggest, to landscape gardening and landscape painting and the open-air portrait and the sporting picture is the English climate. Climate is indeed, as I lecture to this series, one of the fundamental premises of character. The English climate has been discussed so often and, and ridiculed so often that it may be just as well to quote to you here a very different view. It was Charles II's view, and you must realize that he had been brought up in France, and so he knew what he was talking about. Now he said that he liked that country best, which might be enjoyed the most hours of the day and the most days in the year which he was sure was to be done in England. Uh, you, you may think that this is a king's blatant flattery of his country, but don't forget that no man in the 17th century would have called scorching sunshine something to be enjoyed outdoors. And so outdoor life at that time, and right into the 19th century, required moderate weather too warm not to want to be outdoors, too cool to be idle outdoors, hence sports, hence gardening. And surely such weather turns up for some time on nearly every day in England, however much moisture there may be in the atmosphere lying in wait to condense into rain and to drip off your sandwiches which you have taken to enjoy the sunshine on top of Bowfell or the Gogmagogs or, or, or Porlock Hill. That moisture steams out of Turner's canvases as well. It makes constables so uncannily clear and fresh. And it lays a haze over man and building in England which dissolves their bodily solidity. All that is quite true, but it's not my business at the moment. It rather links up with what I have described as the incorporeal in English art. At the moment, I want to introduce to you the English uh, introduced to you English gardening and a conceit which is, in my opinion, of fundamental importance in the Englishness of art in the 18th century as well as today. The picturesque. The English garden, as you know, the Jardin Anglais, the Englischer Garten, is asymmetrical, informal, varied, and made of such parts as the Serpentine Lake the winding drive and winding path, the trees grouped in clumps, and smooth lawn, mown or cropped by sheep, everywhere and reaching right up to the French windows of the house. Now, I suggest that the English garden is English in a number of ways, all profoundly significant. One I mentioned to you last time, the winding path and the serpentine lake are the equivalent of Hogarth's line of beauty and of the OG curves of the decorated style in architecture. On the other hand, when Hogarth himself uses these motifs of winding paths and serpentine lakes to illustrate a point, he says that they lead the eye a wanton kind of chase. Now that is something a little different. It introduces such elements as surprise in the composition of the English garden. And surprise was indeed one of the elements consciously aimed at. Listen to this. Let not each beauty everywhere be spied, when half the skill is decently to hide. He gains all points who pleasingly confounds, surprises, varies, and conceals the bounds. Now that is Alexander Pope. And although Pope was a teacher of reason, and although he was a friend of Lord Burlington, who, as you may remember, established in 18th century England the clarity and the cubic simplicity of Palladian architecture, Pope designed for himself at Twickenham, on a miniature scale, I must admit, one of the first picturesque gardens in England. That was about uh, 1718. But surprise is not all that Pope demands of a garden. There is also what he calls the amiable simplicity of unadorned nature. Both take us back into the 17th century. 
on the continent, neither of these trends in gardening appeared before the great cultural English invasion of the mid-18th century. But in England, Sir Henry Wooten, the first coherent writer on architecture in the English language, wrote as early as 1624, as fabrics should be regular, so gardens should be irregular. Then Sir William Temple, in his Gardens of Epicure in 1685, he wrote more explicitly, after some pages on the formal gardens of his time, he says there may be other forms wholly irregular that may, for aught I know, have more beauty. Such, he says, are those of the gardens of the Chinese. But to attempt that kind of beauty in England would be an adventure of too hard achievement for any common hands. If that adventure was yet embarked on, that was due to yet another train of thought. And it is this train of thought with which I shall now end. Lord Shaftesbury, the philosopher of the early years of the 18th century, praised wild nature, where neither art nor the conceit or caprice of man has spoiled her genuine order by breaking upon her primitive state. To Shaftesbury, the verdure of the field, and even the rude rocks, the mossy caverns, and broken falls of waters, represent that natural, unartificial world which roused his enthusiasm. Addison, in The Spectator, in 1713, wrote the same more quietly. For my own part, I would rather look upon a tree in all its luxuriance and diffusion of boughs and branches than when it is trimmed into a mathematical figure. Uh, that remark refers, of course, to Dutch gardens and French gardens with their formal parterres and their cut hedges. Now, Shaftesbury refers to the same when he says that his rocks, caves, and waterfalls are nature more truly than the formal mockery of princely gardens. Well, with the formal mockery of princely gardens, politics come in. England is liberty. France is suppressed by her rulers. James Thompson in the long poem which he called Liberty, and in which he sings of Britain, The haughty tyrants never shall tame, also speaks of sylvan scenes in picturesque gardens, such as a pope in miniature has shown. And George Mason, in his essay on design in gardening, 1768, explains the creation of landscape gardening in England by the English sense of independency in matters of taste and in religion and government. There you have the link between liberty and the picturesque, very clearly expressed. But there is also a link between both and certain problems of planning which press hard on us today. You've been listening to a podcast from the archives of the BBC Wreath Lectures. For more podcasts, please visit bbc.co.uk slash radio 4.